Thank you so much for coming today. It means a lot to see so many people here. Um, yes, so I'm Will Page and I'm from the Reading University School of Law. And today we're gonna to be looking at how facial recognition is deployed within public spaces and the impact that has on our, on our lives and our rights. Um, we're gonna go through a little journey today through the streets of London. And it's, I've written a little semi-fictional story just to sort of highlight how facial recognition is commonly used. Um, and how it can manifest itself. Um, I'm sure we all know CCTV, and I'm sure we're all pretty comfortable with that. Maybe, maybe we're not, but it's there and we see it all the time. But only a few decades ago, really similar debates surrounding this, well, surrounding CCTV, were really similar to the debates we see on facial recognition about its role in policing and its role in society. And with this familiarity with CCTV, perhaps it's unsurprising that facial recognition appears to be popping up everywhere. So here are just some examples of where facial recognition is used. So we see the Metropolitan Police use it um, at big events in London, such as the Remembrance Day service. We see, here we see the South Wales Police Department. They've used facial recognition at football matches to identify people who've been criminally convicted of criminal offences at football matches or people banned from the sites. We've also seen um, facial recognition used by the private sector and often with close uh, relationships with the state. So in the case of King's Cross, well, oh, oh my gosh, what's happening? Wait. Um, tech support. Oh wait, is it back? Okay, there we go. See, I can talk to you about the law, but I can't talk to you about the computers. Um, so yeah, so we've seen it used um, by King's Cross, and we'll look at that a lot more later, but in that instance, there was a really close relationship with the state and the private sector there for information sharing. And then we also see it just used independently within supermarkets, um, other types of commercial venues. And we see that as well. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit of where facial recognition is used um, within society. So for today, we're going, like I said before, we're going on a little journey through London. And we're gonna be looking at um, just typical examples of where facial recognition is used. So at first, we're gonna consider facial recognition in a local shop. We're then gonna see it at a protest on a public highway and then we're gonna look at it in the context of a private development, uh, a privately owned bit of land where that houses offices, restaurants, and flats, these kind of places. So I'm gonna to read to you a little story. So hopefully you're semi-comfortable on these chairs and we'll go on, not to slate the chairs, they're all right. So, um, so you get off your train, so you've got to London, you get off your train, and you walk into a local shop and it's around the time teenagers are going to school. So there's a lot of teenagers in there, a lot of school kids and you hear a lot of loud music, you hear a lot of laughing. And then from the other side of the store, you hear someone shout catch. And that's immediately followed by the sound of breaking glass. It's inevitable, it's gonna happen. Anyway, you sort of pay that no mind and you go to pay for your goods. And on leaving, you see security talking to these teenagers about upsetting customers, damaging property, and just generally being a nuisance. And they say they're not welcome back into any of the chains of stores and that they'll know if they come back and you walk past, you soon forget it. It's not your problem. It's just some random kids, right? Anyway, you leave the shop and you start walking down a high street. And in the distance, you hear a lot of noise and you come to realize it's a protest. You get a glimpse of a sign and something about facial recognition. But in the hustle and bustle of it all, you can't turn around. So you're feeling a bit uneasy about this. You go to get your face mask. Um, but of course, you've left it at home. So you walk past the police van with a camera on top and nothing happens. You walk past, you breathe a sigh of relief. Finally, you're a little late at this point, so you take a shortcut through a, a commercial development and you walk past an underground station. And at that underground station, there's a sign on the wall that says, we're using facial recognition to help the transport police. And you wonder to yourself, how can this private development possibly help the police? Um, but after all this thinking, you're far too late and you hurry off. So before we leave to go to London, we have to go to the train station and you know we have to wait a little bit. So um, we're gonna go with some key definitions while we're waiting and then we'll start our journey. So it's probably a good place to start is what is facial recognition? That is not moved, oh there we go, it's a bit delay, sorry. Um, so a good place to start is what is facial recognition? Well, facial recognition works through processing and mapping biometric data from images. Um, so as we can see from this image here, um, we have a face and there's little lines here and that is uh, it mapping the face. So it will measure the distance between the eyes, the forehead, the chin. It'll measure all this and it'll, cre it'll create a unique biometric template. And then this unique biometric template will be compared, compared to other templates 
Um, and then that, that's how it works. It will look at the similarity, and depending on how similar it is, you'll get a match. These images can be captured from CCTV, custody images, or even sometimes social media. Um, so I should probably uh, define what biometric data means. This is going to be a term I'm throwing out a lot today, so definitely get this right. So biometric data is any data relating to physical characteristics. So this is any data that your face, your eyes, um, even the sound of your voice. It can also relate to behavioral characteristics, such as your handwriting, the way you walk, even eye tracking. Um, but of course, today, we're just going to be paying attention to the face. Um, it's worth noting that biometric data is actually considered a sensitive type of data. It's important to us. So we put extra special um, prohibitions on how we can process it. Um, and one way we can process it is if it's in the public interest. So we're going to be considering these examples in law where there's a good enough justification to be using it. Um, it's also worth noting how it normally appears in public space. The police have to cover a wide area, so they usually do it remote. Well, not remotely. They do it on a surveillance van so they can drive it around and park it up where they need to. Um, however, the private sector, they're more interested in protecting a specific location. So facial recognition is usually integrated into their CCTV network. Uh, sometimes the cameras are just upgraded. So that's usually how we see facial recognition being used. What is a watch list? Well, this is probably the most important part. Because a watch list is the foundation of facial recognition, as it contains the unique biometric process, the profiles of all the individuals targeted by the system. The public police can only use facial recognition for law enforcement purposes because it's a sensitive data, there's extra limitations placed on that. And we'll consider a little bit more about what that means later. But for now, we, all we need to know is that policing watch lists need to be bespoke. They need to be targeted for that specific event. And here's just some examples of where the police have used it and how their watch list sort of differed on each occasion. So the Metropolitan Police used that at the Notting Hill Carnival. And in that instance, they were focusing on people who previously committed sexual offences, offences against the person, and people who were banning orders not to attend again. Rather differently, when the Metropolitan Police used it in the Remembrance Sunday Parade, they were actually focusing on a type of people called fixated individuals. And these were individuals who had um, perhaps an, an overly obsessive tendency towards a public figure. And it was essentially a mental health watch list, um, which was quite controversial. Um, but if an individual was registered to be in the area, police would stop them and say they couldn't come into certain areas and keep them away from different individuals. So that's how it was used. Two very different contexts there. In the private sector, watch lists are often managed by subscription. So if you buy into a facial recognition company, you might get a watch list that comes with it as well. And you can contribute to this watch list. So very much like you might have Spotify or Netflix for our sort of updates, um, companies will have the same subscriptions, but for people. And that's how they'll identify who, who shouldn't be in their store. Um, so what is a match? Well, again, this is a really interesting point because everyone has a unique biometric profile. And as you can see in this image here, we might have a watch list and we have images captured on the CCTV. Everyone going past the CCTV will have their face mapped and compared to the image on the watch list. And it requires a certain level of similarity. There has to be a certain level of, uh, I can't remember the term here, but there has to be a certain level of give and take here. So it has to be similar. And we can adjust this similarity level depending on our needs. Um, so yeah, it can, it can vary, but the similarity there is like, is that person similar? 50%, 90%, we'll change that ourselves. Um, and that will generate an alert. And the system sometimes isn't always foolproof. So there's usually a human in the loop. Um, so this means that if the system generates an alert, uh, it will go to a human operator and it's them to determine whether or not it's a true match. Is that person the system saying is that person? Is that really who they are? And in an independent report uh, done into the Metropolitan Police, and this report was done by the Human Rights and Big Data Project from the University of Essex, they observed six trial deployments of the Metropolitan Police and found that out of those six deployments, there were only 22 matches deemed credible by the human operator. And in those instances, when the police found the person or identified the people, 64% of those individuals were incorrect. They weren't the people we were looking for, even though the police had gone, that's our guy. Um, so again, this approach isn't always foolproof. Um, so cool, that's our definitions over. And here are just a few things to keep in mind as we're going through our journey in London. Maybe consider who should be able to use facial recognition. We'll see facial recognition used by the public and private sectors, but because of their different interests and goals, facial recognition will express itself in different ways and it will target different people. Who should use facial, or who should facial recognition target? 
Should it be hardened criminals or just people the police want to question? Should it be individuals who've committed a criminal act in our stores or individuals that have just been quite annoying and we don't want them there anymore? And we'll consider if there's a public interest in keeping certain individuals out of different areas. I don't think there is, but there's a certain way in law we can do that. Um, where should facial recognition be used? Well, we'll consider it in the context of shops, we'll consider it in the context of a protest, and we'll consider it in the context of just privately owned land. And we might wanna consider, are there different areas or different locations where it might not be appropriate to use facial recognition, even if it is lawful? So we're gonna now consider the local shop. So just quickly reminding us of the story, we've gone into a local shop and there's some teenagers in there just, just being teenagers. So. Yeah. Um, so as previously stated, facial recognition, it uses sensitive data, um, which means there has to be a clear public interest in using that. Facial recognition in stores is usually geared towards people who are not welcome back in the store, usually after stealing or assaulting staff. However, there might be instances where we're not welcome back on, on land when we break some rules put on by the landowner. So for example, no walking dogs, no skateboarding, no smoking, no photography, even no bad language or no disorderly conduct. These types of rules are placed on us. And if we break them, we might be asked to be excluded. So the question is, can I be put on a watch list for breaking these rules? Now, the question here isn't fully settled, so I'm gonna try and give you my best guess, but there is a way of interpreting the law that could expand uh, a company's ability to process data outside the criminal acts and into other types of acts. So, so yeah, so as I've said, it's a sensitive type of data, so we need to make sure it's in the public interest. And one way of achieving this public interest is preventing and de detecting unlawful acts. The term unlawful is a little bit broader than the term criminal. So when we talk about a criminal act, we talk about theft, we talk about offenses against the person, we talk about criminal damage. These are criminal offenses, offenses you might commonly find the police being interested in. However, the term unlawful is a little bit broader than that. It encompasses the criminal law, but it also encompasses civil law as well, such as breaching a contract or re-entering land that you don't have permission to enter. This is what, this is uh, the scope of the term unlawful is just broad enough to encapsulate that. So for example, re-entering land that you've been banned on or prohibited from attending again, that would technically be an unlawful act. So the question is, can I be put on a watch list for breaking that? Well, there's a second requirement here and it's the public interest requirement. So it means that if I was gonna be processed, have my data processed for a re-entering land, there would have to be a public interest uh, in stopping me re-entering that property. Um, so for example here, I've got, a, I've got a sign here that you might commonly see at a train station. No, no biking, no scooters, no rollerblading. And it's for the interest of public safety. And I think it makes a lot of sense not to ride a bike when there's trains around. That makes quite a lot of sense. So let's say I was to go to Reading train station right after my talk today and ride my bike through it. And let's say I carried on doing that for about a week and I just wouldn't stop. I don't care about the rules, I'm me. So, you know, I'm gonna ride my bike wherever I want. Now, is there a public interest in putting my data on a watch list to act as an early warning system to, I don't know, security? Is it in the public interest to share that data with other train stations to make sure that I don't go causing trouble at other train stations? Um, so this is one way I think data protection can be used in this way. Um, so yeah. So we're now gonna consider this back in the example of our teenagers. So can teenagers be ex excluded from property? Well, they can be excluded from the property. Landowners can have pretty much absolute discretion on who they can and who can and cannot enter land. The only limitation on that is discrimination law. Um, but can they be put on a watch list is a different question. So is there a public interest in stopping criminal damage? Well, it's an unlawful act. And I think there's quite a high public interest in stopping criminal damage. So that we can tick the box quite there easily. They could probably be put on a watch list for that. Is there a public interest in stopping loud music and disruptive behavior? This will very much depend on how you can identify that public interest. What is the tangible benefit here for the public? And who is the public? Is the public customers who like to go to that store? Is it beneficial for them to have a peaceful shopping experience? Is, it interest, is, the, is the interest there the global economy? You know, will people stop buying at the co-op if there's loads of random teenagers messing around? So these are sort of interests there. Now it's worth noting, oh wait, actually I'll talk about this. So, so even if they are placed on a watch list, should they? Um, so as I said earlier, data sharing within the private sector, okay, close to working. Data sharing in the private sector is something we see very much of, I don't know what's, 
doing that. Anyway, so data sharing in the private sector is something we see quite a lot of. And if we um, share data of these teenagers, they might find themselves excluded from a variety of different locations, and that might lead to other types of social exclusion. Um, but it's worth noting that I think at the moment, facial recognition isn't being used to target trespassers quite yet. There's an avenue there, but because facial recognition is still quite in its infancy, it's high risk to process data in that way. Companies will probably want to stick with criminal grounds just because the public interest is so much clearer there. Um, so yeah, but I also don't think facial recognition should be used in this way. Um, what we see when we talk about exclusion commonly is sometimes exclusionary sort of measures aren't objectively reached and sometimes there is some discrimination there. And I think at the moment it's, with, with the lack of guidance and the lack of certainty, it, it could be quite high risk to start excluding people for non-criminal sanctions. Um, so that's, that's, that's our little bit of the journey there. Um, so now we can consider the high street where we look at facial recognition at protests. And for that, we're gonna be looking at police facial recognition. The rules governing police rec facial recognition are fairly similar to the rules governing the private sector. But because it's the public sector, they have a few more protections there. So one such limitation is, and again, it's because we're dealing with sensitive data, is that they can only process for law enforcement purposes. And it's preventing, investigating, detecting, and prosecuting criminal offenses. So one such example of a use of facial recognition currently being discussed is actually using facial recognition to identify witnesses of crimes. Um, so for example, let's say there's a crime in your local area and you're caught on CCTV. They may not think you've done it, but they may think you may have seen something. So you might then find yourself, I don't know, being approached by a police officer saying, you were here then, can you tell me a little bit about what you saw? Um, a very questionable use of facial recognition at the moment. It's not being used that way quite yet, but it's being talked about apparently. Um, but we see facial recognition used by the police in a variety of different instances. So for example, we've got the Download Music Festival in 2015. Leicestershire Police, they used facial recognition to identify people organized in, in criminal um, or organized theft. And it was really interesting. In this instance, the facial recognition watch list was actually comprised of images from all across Europe. And um, there was an international data sharing um, sort of collaboration here. And we've also seen the examples I spoke about earlier, South Wales Police using it at football clubs. Um, and in that instance, it was anyone with a banning order not to attend or anyone who had previously committed uh, an offense at a football match, which I think is quite a broad uh, category of watch list, but yeah. Um, so who can be on a policing watch list? Well, like I said earlier, policing watch lists really have to be custom made. And this is to make sure police are only looking for the people they really need to. And this is to stay within their human rights obligations. And we'll consider that a little bit more in a bit. Um, and when they're doing this, in order to stay within their legal sort of framework, they need to make sure they're very clear of who is on a watch list. So this, does this include hardened criminals or people wanting for questioning? Is this people who have witnessed crimes or missing persons? They really need to be clear on what that deployment is for and who it's gonna target. They also need to be clear on where it's gonna be deployed. And so they need to have very clear criteria on how and where they can deploy this technology. So here are two images, it will load in a minute. Yeah, so here are two images. And this I think demonstrates the tension that we have. We have facial recognition and we talk about public space, but public spaces can be very different depending on how they're being used. So here we've got a public high street where you have a right to privacy. You have your right to privacy from the state all the time, sometimes, well, I'll explain when you don't have a right to privacy in the state very much in next. Um, but when we talk about um, protest, you also have a right to freedom of assembly. You have a right to freedom of speech. And therefore, would the presence of facial recognition have a more significant impact? Well, police can deploy facial recognition at protests. And this is because you don't have an absolute right to privacy. You don't have an absolute right to freedom of speech. The state can overstep that sometimes if it's in the public interest or they're trying to fight crime. So we need to find out if that type of processing is proportionate or the use of facial recognition is proportionate in that instance. So they have to follow four general steps in order to find out whether it is proportionate. And by proportionality, I mean, you're not using a hammer to crack a nut. You know, we have to use the right means in order to get the right results. We can't do too much. So there needs to be a legitimate aim important enough to justify interfering with that right. And I've got here privacy. Um, and this could be proved in different ways. So there needs to be a justifiable reason. So, you know, perhaps the group protesting has previously been 
associated with unlawful acts, perhaps previous events, if it's a reoccurring event they're protesting, or perhaps it attracted bomb threats, apparent, maybe it attracted other types of criminal damage and disorder, the police would need to demonstrate there's a justifiable interest in having the facial recognition used at that event. The facial recognition needs to be rationally connected to that aim. So the aim of preventing crime, for example, the facial recognition watch list really needs to focus on the criminal elements, maybe perhaps people who have been associated with criminal activity at the protest. It can't focus and it should not be able to focus on peaceful protesters. It shouldn't be able to do that. Um, a less intrusive measure can't be used. So it's been noted due to sort of facial recognition's novel capabilities of identifying individuals, we can't really use any other types of technology. So therefore it's uh, less intrusive in that way, less intrusive measure can't be used. Whether it's intrusive or not, I think is still up for debate. But the UK Court of Appeal um, said that actually, because facial recognition processing is so instantaneous, so if we're not on the watch list and there's no match, our data will be deleted immediately. And they say because of that, it's, uh, it's very minimal impact on our privacy. I personally, I think that's far too literal. And I think they don't take into account the symbolic nature of surveillance and the relationship we have with the state and perhaps the psychological impacts that has on us and our ideas of privacy. Um, then we've got the last point here. A fair balance has to be struck between the public and the individual. So we can have my data sort of processed, but it would have to be done in a clear and transparent way. I'd have to know what the police were doing with that data, when my data would be deleted and why it was being used. And again, this is a really important point and I'll flag this up in a bit, but it should be used for a limited time. They can't use it 24 hours a day and they can't use it anywhere they like. They need to be very clear that they're using it perhaps during rush hour at a train station, for example, because perhaps there's more crime there. Um, so they'll have to really target that deployment for the justifiable interests. So, and I think this is just a really interesting point to note. So is there a right to hide your identity? Um, so here is a quote from the Metropolitan's police report um, into their own use of facial recognition. And they said individuals who avoided the system shouldn't automatically be stopped. We shouldn't be stopping people because they don't want to have their data processed. But they noted that uh, the police officers should use their discretion and judgment. Oh no, I don't know what's doing with this. Uh, oh, there we go. I don't know why it's doing that, but um, they have to use their discretion and judgment in order to engage with that individual. Um, and it's quite interesting because when we uh, are processing facial recognition data in this way, uh, consent is almost impossible to obtain. And because of that, we don't ask for your consent when we process that data. We process it on legitimate interests or our public interests, public safety. Consent isn't a decisive factor. And therefore, covering your face is only the true way to opt out. If you cover your biometric data, they can't process it. But that being said, a criminal would probably do the same thing. So how do police use their discretion and judgment in order to determine who's a criminal and who's not? Are they making a judgment call as to who's likely to be a criminal? Or do they just stop everyone who avoids the system? And I think we really have to question, oh no, oh no, it's still there, sorry, I thought it'd gone again. Um, do we have enough trust in policing institutions to make sure that this judgment call isn't based on a discriminatory, a discriminatory sort of bias? And here I've got this newspaper article here. Someone police, said the police stopped someone from covering their face and they fined him 90 pounds after protesting. Just to clarify, I think the term protest is so generous in this. I don't know if anyone's seen this video, you'll be able to find it if you Google it. He used some vulgar language at the police and he was understandably upset he got stopped. Um, but I think maybe protest is quite generous. He was just, he was just angry, that's fair enough. Um, so, oh yeah, and I just wanted to say actually, so in my view here, the way in which policing is governed in terms of a legal perspective it's a much better system when we compare it to the private sector. The private sector is a lot looser. Here, there's so much more clarity. There's so much more accountability. There's so many more tighter controls. That being said, there is still a risk to discriminatory practices. Um, and I think that's something we should still be concerned about. So now we're considering the shortcut. And this is really, I, I get excited. This is like my bit. Um, so um, we take a shortcut through a, a private development and we're going to be considering how public and private sectors cooperate with each other, how they share data. So at the beginning, I said, how could a private development help the police? You know, they're just landowners. They're just their land. What can they do? Well, the Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner literally last month released a report where it was said that London was the third most surveilled city in the world. And nearly all of this technology is actually privately owned. 
It's not the police that have it, it's privately owned. Um, and one of the main reasons we want to have information sharing agreements is so the police can easily access the data of the private networks and they can share data and move forward in their crime fighting like agendas. So I said we're going to talk about the case of King's Cross. And this is King's Cross, if you haven't been. It's, wait, is it still there? No, okay, okay, sorry, it's slightly low, slightly slow here. But this is King's Cross, if you haven't been. It's located right between King's Cross Station and St. Pancras International. And why am I talking about this? Well, between 2016 and 2018, Camden Police worked with the landowners of King's Cross and their security. And they used facial recognition uh, to target individuals that the police wanted to find. So the police gave their security seven custody images of people under an information sharing agreement. And these could have been of individuals wanted by the police, known offenders, just known offenders in the area, or perhaps just missing persons. The report given to the Mayor of London was kind of vague as to who was on the list, so it could have been anyone there. And they were shared to help prevent crime, protect vulnerable members of the public, and sort of follow the community safety strategy. Images and reference numbers were provided. Names were not commonly given, but they could have been given to the, to the private sector. Um, this was where it was used. Um, and we'll consider some of the ambiguities of that recently. But does anyone know where the camera is here? Can anyone see it? Which one? The first pillar. The first pillar. In the middle, the, the, the black cameras? It's two, two, at the top. two at the top. I'm so sorry, but it's actually not. It's this one here. And this is, wait, was that the one you were referring to, the, the white one? Yeah. Those two, yeah. So they're just regular cameras. They're just regular CCTV. Now, I went here, and I'm, I completely get why you didn't know where they were, because I went here knowing I was looking for this specific location. I walked past it like three or four times. You know, yeah, I couldn't find it. It's not supposed to be seen, I don't think. It's very subtle. So that's a facial recognition camera if you haven't seen one. And you might note that it's pointed towards the entrance and exit of the train station. So every, every single person leaving the train station gets their face scanned. That's so convenient. So that's how it's used. So the police in that instance were using the sort of the private surveillance networks in order to increase their scope of surveillance activity. So in this instance, you were scanned by a privately controlled system, but compared to a policing watch list. Now these types, of gov like these types of agreements are governed by additional rules held in a contract um, that tries to bring the private sector level of processing to the police's level. And that's one, I think that's a really good way of managing these agreements. However, the, the private sector could just hand the data over to the police if they wanted and it would sort of sidestep all these extra rules. Um, but this kind of blurring of public and private police and kind of does have consequences and it does have ambiguities. So for example, we have different rules on processing. So as I said earlier, the police can only process data for law enforcement, but the private sector, they can perhaps use, it, use their sort of approach to just process unlawful acts, which are slightly broader than criminal acts. However, we then we have two standards of legal accountability operating on the same camera. I don't think that makes much sense. Um, so yeah, that's a bit weird. The second one is we have different rules on deployment so public police, as I said earlier, they can only focus on a limited time frame and a limited scope or a limited footprint. For example, during rush hour, there might be more thefts at a train station, more pickpocketing. So they might cover it at that time and it might be at a specific location. So they might focus on that location. And they have to do that to make sure their aims pursued are in the public interest and stay within their human rights accountability. However, it's my understanding that the private sector, they can deploy facial recognition for as long as they wish, as long as they don't take too much data. So again, there's a slight difference in how we address this idea of proportionality. One's about how we proportion it in terms of our deployment, another one's just focused on regulating that the collection of data. At least I think I'm right. So um, yeah, so now we're at the end of our journey. So I'm just gonna quickly go through um, and put it side by side so we can kind of see an overview of what we've been through. So we went to the shop first and we saw there was a watch list there. And that watch list covers um, both sort of criminal and civil wrongs. And the watch list in that instance can be shared amongst loads of different uh, subscribers. When we look at the police, for example, we see watch lists are limited only to the public interest and law enforcement. So it can only be used for law enforcement activities. And watch lists in that instance have to be bespoke for each deployment. They can't just reuse the one again and again. They really need to be tailored for that specific deployment. Again, we have the shortcut where watch lists are a product of public and private sources, and there's quite a bit of ambiguity as to how that's governed. Um, so I might want to do a postdoc in that, so just so. Um, so, uh, so what should our future be? So 
Right, there we go. So what should our future be? So should we be using facial recognition? And if we are, should we be using it at all? So police are held to a higher level of accountability. So actually, no, I kind of said that wrong. But police are held to a higher level of accountability. So we might say, perhaps it's better they use it. Perhaps we might want anyone to use it at all and say it's far too risky to have um, because of that risk to discrimination. And even if we get the technology perfectly right, policing practices might just be inherently discriminatory. But that's a very controversial discussion, so maybe not for today. But um, it's one of these points. Um, the second one is, do we have enough trust in these institutions? Like I said before, public perception has probably dwindled towards the police, policing authorities, especially that of the Metropolitan Police. And I think there's so much more to be done in order to sort of gain that public trust. Are you going to change back? Please change. There we go. Um, there's so much more to be done to in order to regain that public trust. And perhaps using facial recognition isn't quite the way to go. Again, with the private sector, whilst they do work within the public interest, um, they're probably always going to be sort of moving towards that profit-oriented goals. Money is always the bottom line. So whilst they want to protect, whilst they want to introduce um, facial recognition in their stores, who are they targeting? They're targeting probably shoplifters because it costs them money. They often target people who assault their staff as well, um, but shoplifting is like one of the big ones that they focus on. Um, Will this technology impact our ability to participate in society? And I think definitely, I think it definitely will. We might see individuals start self-excluding themselves from areas because of fear of being mistaken for someone else or perhaps having negative interactions within those areas. Uh, we might see individuals just getting excluded generally from public places and local amenities, especially if sort of it's not regulated quite as well as it should be. But I also think the use of facial recognition at a protest is quite symbolic. Um, it says something very strongly about the capabilities of the state, but also our relationship with the state as well. Um, oh, wait, sorry, I went too far. And also, how should we be able to participate in, in changing this in the future law? At the moment, we're seeing the technology companies really pushing forward and saying, this is how we're going to be using it. And the government's buying into this and investing quite a lot into it. So do we need to write to our MPs? Are we brave enough to take to the streets? Do we need to shop stopping in these locations that are using this technology? But I often say, can we stop shopping in these locations? Do we have the economic freedom? It's a cost of living crisis. You know, we can't afford to be picky. So perhaps if there is a store using facial recognition, perhaps we don't have that economic choice. You know, and do we need to protect ourselves? Do we need to start taking matters into our own hands and protecting our own identities? But then also at the same time, risking being you know, like singled out by the state? You can't win. Um, so the future of facial recognition will have a significant impact. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, will have a significant impact on our ability to interact within public spaces, but only time will tell what that impact will be. And because I was told this talk was so depressing, um, I've, uh, I've, I'm trying to end on a fun quote. So this idea about, and I should get an award for not referencing Orwell once around all of this. So this is not from Orwell, I promise. Um, but this is a quote, and it sort of says, you know, we're so preoccupied about talking about our capabilities as a society and our technological capabilities. Are any of us actually thinking whether we should be using this? Um, does anyone know where this is from? It's a great film. It's a film. Yeah, so, yeah it's Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Yeah, there we go. It wasn't all well, and I feel like I broke the broke the whole code there, so that's all good. Right, I'm done. Um, thank you so much for listening. And that's everyone I should say thank you to. <laughs>